Good morning. We figured we would just stop announcing when I'm preaching so that you guys don't plan your vacation during that time. So we're just going to spring it on you. Bill, if you're watching, I know you're watching. I did go with the tie today. I know you were concerned or inquisitive, so I did go with the tie. And it turned out phenomenal. The knot is, is really good this morning. And it doesn't always turn out that way. God, you are good to us. We thank you for your goodness. We praise you for this morning, for this opportunity. We pray that you'll speak to our hearts this morning. Nourish us through your word. Give us practical application to apply your word to our lives, that we may be more like you. We ask these things in your precious, glorious name. Amen. Let me get a little... Perfect. On November 21st, 1943, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote a letter to his fiancée, Maria von Wiedermeyer, while he was imprisoned by Hitler during World War II. In the letter, he talked about a spiritual lesson he was learning from his life in prison. He wrote, a prison cell in which one waits and hopes, does various unessential things, and is completely dependent on the fact that the door to freedom has to be opened from the outside. Much like our lives, the bondages and the things that we find ourselves in, the door to freedom has to be opened from the outside. We cannot free ourselves um, we think we make a conscious choice. You know, self-help doesn't work if self is the problem. And for many of us, that's, that is the problem, is we are uh, obedient to self and not dead to self. So the door to freedom has to be opened from the outside, and that is Jesus. And that, that in itself, that I cannot free myself, offers me hope and we, uh, we're talking about abiding in hope this morning. It offers me hope that I have an advocate, that I have one who is fighting for me and trying to free me. A theme of hope is welcomed when we are faced with all that life can hurl at us. There is a lot going on. When we are filled with fear, when we are faced with pain or illness, we need the hope of God's presence, God's power, and God's promises. When a pandemic has us on lockdown and lives are being lost, when fires burn seemingly out of control and structures are consumed, when the effect of those fires is smoke so bad it threatens our ability to take a simple breath, we need the hope that God is aware of what is going on in our lives. I need that hope. And I'm going to share with you why we can have hope this morning. When it seems the world has lost its mind and has become hostile to God and everything good, then we need the hope of knowing that God is still in control and is the ultimate victor. We believe that and we can say that we believe that. Do you know the difference between believing and knowing? There was a little boy... And I've told you the story before, but it just illustrates this point so well. Who grew up in the city. He, he didn't know much about green space or forests or anything. And so his uncle was taking him camping. And it, his first time in nature, seeing all the stars with the lights of the city, he never really appreciated space or stars or the outdoors or the forest. And so they went camping and the, the uncle starts a fire and they begin to roast s'mores. The little guy puts a marshmallow on the end of his stick and invariably he gets too close to the fire, catches on fire, and falls off into the fire. Now the little boy, not knowing any better, starts to reach into the fire. And the uncle says, no, 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 you, you can't do that. The fire, will it'll burn you. It'll, you'll have bonfires on the end of all your little fingers. You, you can't do that. You'll get burned. And he goes, oh, okay, I believe you, I believe you. So they, they roast mellows, and they're roasting and roasting, and... Many mellows down the line, the bag runs empty. 
they weren't done having fun yet, and so the uncle, being a, a veteran camper and a vetro, veteran marshmallow roaster, goes to his trunk, and underneath the spare tire, he has an emergency pack of marshmallows. We all do. And while he's away, the young boy's got his last mellow, gets it too close to the fire. It catches on fire, gets really gooey, and falls into the fire. Now, because I heard the words my uncle said, and I believe him, but he doesn't know how fast I am. I am so fast, I can reach into that fire and get my mellow out of there before the fire touches me. He reaches into the fire and he has five little bonfires on the end of all his fingers and his burning marshmallow. And at that moment where he felt the pain, he went from believing to knowing. It was based on his experience. We can say we believe in God, but not until we have experienced God in our lives. Or maybe until we've been burned by not experiencing God in our lives that we know that is there. I, I said last week or the last time I spoke outside that if, if we look back in our lives, we can see the area where God's hand has been with us and has kept us and has sustained us and has brought us through difficult times. When you're in the midst of the battle, when Peter looked around at the wind and the waves when he was walking on the water to Christ, he got overwhelmed. And when you're in the middle of the, the, the pandemic and the fires and the, and the lockdowns and nobody can come to church, and you're in the middle of that, it's hard to see the end of it. But we have an experience. We can look back and see what God has done and be confident in what he's going to do. It's the hope of knowing that God is in control, not just believing. Have you ever heard someone say, let go and let God? Have you ever let go and let God? And you feel great for 25 minutes and then you walk back outside and you realize that the car still won't start and that you still have financial problems and it all comes flooding back again and again and so i just read a recent article and it says that letting go and letting god isn't a one-time deal i have to continually let go and it seems like we in the instant gratification society in which we live and everything like the pastor said last week the, the power of of information is in the palm of our hand. We can have everything instantly. <laughs> My daughter, God love her, she is a, uh, a DoorDash maniac. You can have a dozen Krispy Kreme cone donuts and a milkshake DoorDash right to your door. You don't have to leave home. <laughs> I know because she's done it. <laughs> And it's, it's everything in our society is instant and instant and instant. My hope, knowing God has and knowing God will, is constant, is daily, even in the middle of the struggle. And it's, it's, it's something that I have to fight through again and again and again. It is so easy. I, I told you a, a year or two ago, God allowed me to experience depression, which I'd never experienced in my life. I'm just take things as they come and, and happy-go-lucky. And God allows me, allowed me to experience depression. And it was debilitating. I, I, I at times, lacked this, uh, the want to, to get out of bed, to do anything, to eat, to go to the fridge. Depression had me so locked up and bound. And, and he brought me out of it so quickly, and, and it was all a lesson for me that I can understand. My wife suffers from depression, and many people suffer from depression, that, that I have to speak to hope. I have to hold on to hope. I have to know that there is something better, that there is something greater. There was a, uh, a parade in Denver, Colorado. And they had this parade, and it was a 30-year tradition Faith Bible Church, a, one of the largest evangelical churches in Colorado, in Denver area, wanted to enter a float into the parade. So they contacted the parade directors and said, we want to enter a float. And they said, well, what are you going to do? And they said, we are going to sing Christian hymns and Christmas songs, and we want to hang a banner on our float that says, Merry Christmas. They were denied a float because they said their message was too provocative. It, it is too provocative, they said. The parade is billed as an international procession to celebrate the cultural and ethnic diversity of the region. Merry Christmas. A Christmas parade, parade is celebrating the international, cultural, and ethnical diversity of the region. 
So instead of a Christian float with a message of Merry Christmas, the parade will feature gay American Indians, kung fu artisans, and belly dancers. Now, how is that to get people in the Christmas spirit? The Rocky Mountain News reported that also included in the parade were performers of the Lion Dance, a Chinese New Year tradition meant to chase away evil spirits and welcome good luck and good fortune into the new year. God help us. The parade spokesman, Michael Krikorian, told the news, we want to avoid that specific religious message out of respect for other religions in the region. It could be construed as disrespectful to other people who enjoy the parade each year. It is my instinct, maybe my human nature, maybe there's some of Jesus is being angry and sinning not, that the anger just riles up in me, and I am so bothered by that. And I'm, as I continue to think about it, we can't be angry with people who don't share our hope. If this life and the things that we can touch or see or feel is all that we can hope in, they're going to be short-sighted. Our hope is not dependent on any direction cultural may be, culture may be drifting, good or bad. Our hope is in something quite different. There are three areas that cement the Christian's hope. Who we are, whose we are, and where we are. I, I, I bring this message this morning that we can just for a moment think outside of the immediate. And if you consider this morning who you are. We are children of God, created by his hands, redeemed by his blood, and promised eternal life in the, in the place he prepared. We are the children of God. We are redeemed. Heirs of a coming kingdom. This is our present reality and our inheritance. It kind of it gives us hope. It gives me hope. We can't or shouldn't be angry with those who would oppose the Merry Christmas greeting. They don't have our hope. We should pray for them with genuine concern. I mean, what do people hope in that can't hope in Christ? What do they put their faith and hope in if they don't have Jesus? If this world is all there is, then there is nothing transcendent. There is nothing beyond it's nothing beyond what they can see or touch. It's nothing on which they can place their hope and their trust. The Old Testament says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, and that meant wealth and power. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Outside of God, anything in which we can place our trust and hope will surely fail. I told you before, I, I hope you all like me and I would want you all to like me but if you put your faith hope and trust in me i will fail you i will eventually fail you pastor john will eventually fail you jesus never fails and that's hope that is that is hope if there were no god in the beginning for those who don't have hope in christ then the best they can hope for is a godless future but we have a sure and certain hope. Our lives began with God and will continue to eternity with God. Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5. I, I, I don't say all of the verses that you're reading, but I, I'm going to read a portion of it. You can see the whole verse there ahead of you, though. I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. You know what set apart means? I've told you this before as well. Set apart means holy. The chair you're sitting on is set apart for a specific task. It is holy unto that task, and that task is holding you up. He chose us and set us apart. He chose us and called us holy. He set us apart for a specific task 
before we were born. Isaiah 49.1 says, The Lord called me before my birth. From within the womb, he called me by name. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians 1.15, But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Before the world was formed, before, any, before my life was, I was called and I was chosen. That gives me hope. You were called and you were chosen and you have hope. He called us by his marvelous grace. It's true for them, and it's true for us, and it's true for you. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 6, All praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Because we are united with Christ, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. Amen. Before the world was formed, he knew my name. Before the world, before time began, he knew your name and he said your name. And he knows your name today. Fact. God knew you before you were even born, before the world was created. Fact. He set you apart belonging to him. Fact. He called you and knew your name that you might know him and live with him forever. This is who you are. This is your heritage, and your position is secure in him. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4, Peter wrote, And into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It can never perish. It can never fade. It is undefiled. It will never spoil. It is who you are. First Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Pandemics and fires and destruction and decay and sickness and disease can all, because I am saved, I am called, I am known by God. I have been adopted into his family. And I have hope. Revelation says it this way. I don't have the slide. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. He has made us to be a kingdom and priest, a royal priest, a holy nation. He has made us for that. He has called us back. And it gave him great pleasure, Ephesians said. It was God's great pleasure to know us, to call us, and to adopt us. To build your life around your own strengths and your own abilities is an illusion. You need something lasting. And that something is who you are in Christ. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, which is the hope of glory. I'm so glad it doesn't say, put your hope in Mike, the hope of glory. But Christ in Mike, and Christ in Alan, and Christ in Landon, and Christ in insert your name is the hope of glory. Christ in you, you are called, you are anointed, you are gifted. He set you apart, and that has to give us hope. We have hope in God because of who we are. And we have hope in God because of whose we are. He is the anchor of our hope. 
He is the Father, and we are his children. He has ransomed, restored, and raised us. We have confidence because our confidence is in him and not in our own ability and our own strengths. We've each at times have tried things our way and said, God, you get the day off today. I'll take care of this and I'll handle it. And it seems like when we inevitably fail and turn to God, he doesn't shake his head and he doesn't say how disappointed he is. He says, come to me, my child. I decided that I'm going to save a step. And instead of trying things my way, I'm just going to trust God. I'm going to put my hope in whose I am. He saw fit to know my name before birth, before the foundation of the world. He spoke my name set me apart, I think that's deserving of my hope and my trust and my faith. We can have hope because we know that God knows what is going on in our lives. He's the friend that sticks closer than the brother. He will never leave us or forsake us. He is involved and he knows what's happening in your life. He knows your fears. He knows your doubts. He knows your failures. He knows your scars. He knows your guilt and he knows your shame. And he says, God, I'm crazy about you. I love you so much. You are my chosen one. You are special. We can have courage to face the future because he holds the future in his hands. God has overcome and that makes us victorious. It is so easy to look at the wind and the waves and to be overwhelmed and to throw our hands up or to give up or to lapse into depression. But he overcame. And his overcoming makes us victorious in the process. We can be sure of And hope for a tremendous ending because Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. You can be certain of it. You can be sure of it, that he's invested in me and he's not going to give up on me and he's not going to let me go. And he's invested in you. He's not going to let you go. No matter what happens in life, no matter what happens, Paul says, for me to live is Christ. If I live, I'm going to keep on sharing Christ. And if I die, I gain. I get eternity in heaven with him. I, it's a win-win. I do not lose. And that's our, our hope in this life. No matter what happens with pandemics or fires or, or sickness or disease, we have Christ. And that is my hope. He that began the good work in you We'll see it through to completion. Praise God. We can redirect our hope and confidence from ourselves because of whose we are. Our efforts, our abilities transfer from from us to our rock and to our firm foundation. Do you know the difference between wishing and hoping? I'm going to tell you. A wish is used during Desperate events and deep longing with a slim possibility of it happening. Hope is backed by reasonable confidence. We hope for things that are possible and likely. It must be true. I got it on the internet. Am I ahead or am I behind? I'm ahead. There was a time, at that time you were without Christ, Ephesians 2.12 says, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants and promises without hope and without God in the world. There was a time where we were without hope before realizing who we are and whose we are. 
But there came a time when we recognized who we are and whose we are. The Spirit-filled life is a life in which we wait actively present in the moment, trusting that new things will happen to us, things that are far beyond our own thought, imagination, or prediction. I'm going to read that again because I stumbled all over my sloppy writing. This Spirit-filled life is a life in which we wait, actively present in the moment, trusting that new things will happen to us, things that are far beyond our own thought, imagination, or prediction. To hope in God, to hope in Christ, is to give up control, transferring confidence from self to God. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians reads like this. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ Jesus with a resounding yes. And through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm in Christ. He has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own by placing his Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything that he has promised us. He has instilled his spirit in us which was a down payment, which was a deposit. And that deposit is a guarantee of future events, of what is to come. I don't have to hope in me. I don't have to be enough. I get to surrender and say, God, I trust you, and I need you, and I am in you, and you have adopted me, and I am in the family, and I know that I am an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus. I know this to be true, and that gives me hope because Mike is sometimes not the best. And you can insert your name there. It is the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. It's a it's a whew moment. We put so much pressure on ourselves, and I have to be, or I have to do, or I have to get, or I have to I have to live, I have to. Let go. Let God. Let go often. He has sealed us and made us his own by adoption. He has made a deposit of his spirit in us, guaranteeing what is to come. That should be the definition of hope. I have begun in you. I will see it through to completion. I made a deposit in you that guarantees future events. That is your hope. That is whose you are. I don't know what the slides are doing. I skipped another slide. Second Timothy 2.13, if you want to write it down. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. We are hopeful because of whose we are. We discussed who we are, and we discussed whose we are. And the third area of hope, where we are. It's not your address or the state in which you live. And so many times we have our identity locked into those specific things, those identifiers. Try to understand this. Stop it. If we are in Christ, we are living in the kingdom. The kingdom of God is here. It is within us and around us. We are walking with God every day. We live with an awareness of his presence and the expectation of his working in our lives. Heaven has begun for believers. Eternity with Christ has already started. It's it's seen beyond where I am physically and more where I am spiritually. If you realize where you are spiritually, then wind and waves and fires and pandemics have no effect. The resurrection is a promise of eternal life for us. God has shared his joy with us, placed his peace within us, because 30 minutes has passed. 
stop it. <laughs> God has shared his joy with us and placed his peace within us because we are kingdom living. We live in hope because of where we are. We live with confidence in the present and we face the future with courage. Hebrews 6.19 reads, We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. They did a study, and it's, it's going to seem really cruel, and it seemed really cruel to me, but they put some rats in a pail of water. One group of rats, they put in the pail of water, and they, they swam around, and they, within an hour, they had all given up and, and died. The other group of rats, they would raise them briefly from the water and put them back in the water. And the group of rats that had that hope of being saved or that hope of catching their breath or that hope of not drowning lasted for 24 hours. Hope is a powerful thing. We should have sang this morning, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Hope is a powerful thing. And it's, it's freeing and it's liberating to know that our hope is not in ourselves. That our hope is an anchor, is a sure and true foundation. That our hope is in Christ. Oh, Ephesians is on there. Paul said it like this in Ephesians 1.18, and this is how we'll close. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. If he prays that our eyes would be open, that means at some point our eyes were closed. Open our eyes to the hope. Open our eyes to adoption. Open our eyes to the fact that we are heirs of God, that we are joint heirs with Jesus, that we have an eternal home, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Open your eyes to that hope, to the riches of his glorious inheritance in Christ Jesus. Father, when things seem hopeless, we can hope. When life around us is confusing, when we're unsure of our ability or our standing, we can have hope and be sure of an anchor that is you. Thank you for your promises. Thank you for the deposit of your Holy Spirit in our lives to continue to feed and fuel our hope to ensure us of our future home. God, we lay aside our strength and our ability and our, our clutching and our holding on and we truly let go this morning and we cling to the hope that is you, the hope that you instill in us, the hope that's begun in us because of our salvation through the work of Jesus Christ. And we have hope. We have hope for tomorrow. We have hope for eternity. Let us walk and live and be examples of that hope and to share that hope with a lost and dying world who desperately needs you, who isn't even sure why their opposition to you is so militant. But God, we have the hope, and we share that hope, and we walk in that hope, and we live in that hope. We are forever abiding in hope. We thank you, Lord, in your precious, glorious, wonderful name. Amen. Land and play is out. Thank you this morning. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your attentiveness. There was only two or three of you here that fell asleep, so that's a good ratio. Thank you all. Um, and God bless you, and, and, and cling to hope. Amen. Amen.